Okay, so Sheila, thank you for being here. Um, I know that people have reached out and chatted with you about our mental health bills and you have a limited time frame. So we welcome your testimony. Hello, committee. Thank you so much for accommodating my schedule this morning. I do appreciate that. I'm Shayla Livingston. I'm the director of policy for the Agency of Human Services. And we, um, the Department of Mental Health, I'm here representing the Department of Mental Health um, as I have been their policy director as well um, up until recently, and I'm supporting them in that um, manner as well. So you've heard from the commissioner of mental health on this topic, and um, I think also maybe the deputy commissioner, but I wanna be very clear that the department is incredibly supportive of peer certification and peer respite um, beds, that that's something that the department has been looking at and working on. And I and uh, we sent you a memo, and I'm just going to very briefly hit on the high level of that, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Essentially, the, for, uh, let me just make sure the committee understands that that's a memo memo from Commissioner Hawes, and it was addressed to Cheryl, uh, Senator Hooker, and myself because we had been working on the this this area together with the department. So, but it's on our web page. Thank you, Chair, yeah, exactly. Um, in that memo, the department just outlines briefly the work that is underway right now on peer certification. So the department included peer certification, has, has requested um, a white paper, a requested white paper on peer certification, and, and that was published. And then the department has worked um, with Pathways on a grant application um, to the department using HCBS funds that we requested in the BAA that is pending in front of the legislature. So those HCBS funds would fund, I believe it's Pathways, but a grant to examine peer certification and come up with a framework for that certification um, process, including definitions that the committee is considering in uh, S-194. We've also been in communication more recently with OPR on this topic and would include OPR in that process and in that work group to ensure alignment um, and um, also leverage any of their resources that would make more sense uh, to include in this process. They have a really specific process that Lauren is much more um, able to describe to you than I am, but I do think that it is important that we work um, hand in hand with them, um, as well as with Pathways and the peers to, to consider this for Vermont. The Department of Mental Health is, is committed to this. We want to do it. We don't want to, we, we don't want the committee to feel that we are slowing it down, but we do want to do it deliberately. And we do have this process and this funding already in place and already in legislation pending before you all right now in terms of the funding for it. Following that, and again, I want to be really clear, we are supportive of the respite bed concept. We do think that it makes sense to, to solidify and finalize the peer certification work and also to potentially leverage the information from the beds that we already fund in order to get the committee the information you are looking for in the pilots that are described in S-195. That way we could use existing resources and information, as well as the process that would be set up through peer certification in order to then walk into um, considering a framework for respite beds for this state with more information and with a peer certification already set up. I think the last thing I will say um, on that topic is simply that the, the funding that is outlined and, and described in S-195 um, Currently, we would, we would need to make some modifications to that if it were feasible. And um, I do just need to say it's not in the governor's budget right now, so I'm not clear where that money would come from. Um, at least in the department's budget, there is not room for that. So again, happy to take questions, but I do wanna be super clear that we are very supportive of both ideas and concepts and are already um, working and have been working on the peer certification front actively and do fund those respite beds and are interested in that. Oh, sorry, one more thing. We did do an RFI um, 
as part of the capital bill. And we did get some responses to that RFI. It's, there's a report, Act 50 report, that I'm happy to send to Aaron to post on your um, on your website or your webpage as well. We did that report for uh, this year and six different responses for unlocked community residential beds were provided to the department around ideas for how to improve community access to those residential beds. And many of them did include peer aspects. So that also might be of interest to this committee to review. True. No. Okay. I'm happy to take questions. Yep, I've got questions. So I, I guess uh, we've been working on this now for a, over a month. So I, we're, we're happy to finally see something in writing that helps. Um, but but it, it, there is a concern that we have simply because, as you know, and probably as, as a department is, and the agency uh, is concerned, we'd like to move forward. And so every time we, we take a step forward, we somehow take two steps back with a working group or a report or something else. And the, the ideas for an, from the RFI um, are ideas. We're, frankly, you know, and I know we've talked about this and I know that the agency has had huge turnover and changes and the pandemic has been going on, but we certainly would like to have some recommendations that we can have in the bill, and Senator Hooker's been working very hard on this, uh, that we can take that step forward without having to backtrack. So is there, as you're looking at the bills before us and then at your memo, and we're gonna have to call through the memo with our ledge council, it will be helpful to have some proposal that does take us that step forward. And I, but, and having said all that, of course, we do understand the conditions under which you are working, but we know that there are folks in the community who are really ready to go. So we, we want to make sure that we're capturing the enthusiasm and the energy that exists out there in, in our real world and that we can move forward. And I'm going to turn to Senator Hooker and uh, first with your questions and then Sheila, please, you know, we welcome your comments. Okay, thank you, Senator Lyons. And you've said a lot of what I've been thinking and the, I guess the point is we have people who are already in place, ready to take this on. Um, what do we need to, to do to move that forward rather than going back and retreading old ground? Um, so if you can, you know, what can we eliminate, I guess, uh, so that we're not duplicating the effort so that we can just, you know, start here and move forward and get this in place as quickly as possible. I mean, we have um, increased need. We've seen it through the pandemic and uh, I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. So the quicker we get on this, the better off we're going to be. So. What would you what would you look at as a timeline for this, I guess, if it goes through the process that you're explaining? Absolutely. And I appreciate that very much from both of you, the, the urgency around it. Um, I if it's OK, I would I do want to phone a friend a little bit with <laughs> Lauren to <laughs> describe their sunrise process for this type of certification. I do also want to be super clear that we have we as soon as the BAA passes that grant to actually propose that goes forward to propose a certification framework is ready to go. So that would it's not like a then we have to write the grant then we have to think about like you all say yes we are ready to to move on that. Um, so that so I, so that process could start basically almost immediately. The, uh, the question around respite beds and, and where to put them and who can catch that work and, you know, building them. So it, it, the, again, I just want to be really clear on the process. If we stood that up, um, there's some questions around, if, would it be a pilot? Would a pilot make sense? Is that actually what would 
um, be the best use of resources in this moment, given what we already know around this work? Should it be more of a, a consideration going forward once we have peer certification in place and a framework in place of standing up and not necessarily doing a pilot because pilot work in this type of area means that you're building beds and building spaces um, without the security of ongoing funding. Um, we would need to pull DIVA into this conversation uh, in order to make sure that there is security in that ongoing funding. Um, that does have implications. I, I have read the analysis and some of the pieces in the bill as well as other research around the cost savings in these. And so I do think that that is, um, you know, that would absolutely be part of that conversation. But again, it does require um, that consideration in, in the budget process. Um, I do apologize for the fact that you guys have been working on this for a month. Um, we did come in and testify on it, I know, but we did not give specific details and feedback. So that has there has been some turnover in staff on our end, and, and so I do apologize for that. But if it's okay with the committee, if I could hand this to Lauren to answer Before, the You question. can, you can, but before you do that, I just want to uh, discriminate between what we currently see as peer-to-peer -peer certified programs in the state. And I know that we've heard testimony for example, from Sandy Yando, who has been doing peer-to-peer -peer support and is certified under a federal umbrella. Yeah. And but so this peer-to-peer -peer support, just, just to reassure folks, we are not looking at psychotherapy. So we're not looking at master's credentials. We are looking at people with, who have known experiences in the area of mental health issues supporting their peers when they have a, a short-term need. So this, it, I'm trying to understand, you mentioned the word sunrise <laughs> and we'll listen to, to Lauren. We always listen to Lauren and uh, then we'll try to sort out the differences um, and what, we're, what we think we're hearing. So thank you. Yes, Senator, I agree with you that we're not talking about psychotherapy. Terrific. I'm glad we're on the same page with that one. Okay. Uh, Lauren, thanks. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Lauren Lehman with the Office of Professional Regulation for the record. Um, so it's good to hear that it's not talking about psychotherapy. We, OPR just, um, this is a new concept to us, um, not being, you know, being more in the licensing space than in the mental health field. We regulate a number of mental health professionals, but mostly from the licensure perspective. Um, so when reading this bill initially, it was unclear to us whether uh, there would be some form of psychotherapy being used by peers in support of other peers. Um, and I re and um, looking at Ms. Yandow's um, uh, testimony, it, it seems she did request some information, you know, uh, change in the language to be practicing um, therapy. So that was of concern concern to us. Um, so because what OPR has right now and what the state has um, has decided to under its policies is practical um, is is a roster for anybody providing psychotherapy without qualifications. You don't need to have any qualifications or, you know, and by qualifications, I mean education, certain education or certain examination. But if you're providing psychotherapy in the state, it's a consumer protection element where you just register with OPR. So a consumer can check on our website to see hey, this person um, is checking in if there's any discipline, if there's any concern about their practice previously, because we recognize the consumer is in a uniquely vulnerable position when seeking psychotherapy. Um, so for our perspective, if this is exclusive of a psychotherapy, that would bring um, a new um, level of, uh, of detail to this. The Sunrise Report, to Shayla's question and to Senator Hooker, is really looking at right sizing regulation. Um, currently, peer support is permissible in the state without regulation, and and that is exempt from they're exempt from all of our uh, all of our Title Twenty Six mental health profession licensure requirements. There's an exception for peer counseling, regardless of whether consideration is received. The difference, I think, in this level is that they're asking for state 
uh, the S-195 asks for state approval. It's asking for a state certification. And in, traditionally, when we offer that state certification, we go through the Sunrise process, which is tied to a, what we see as a keystone um, a fundamental policy. Um, we don't regulate a profession unless there's a threat of public harm to the public. And once finding that harm, a public harm of unregulated practice. And if there is a finding of public harm, we do the least restrictive um, form of uh, regulation possible. And this just means that we've, we're trying to stay out of burdening workforce entry. Um, in this situation, I you know, would think it, obviously there's a possible potential for public harm if there's an unregulated practice of this industry maybe not or, or if this industry this profession maybe not and that would be our, our kind of threshold question in a um in a sunrise report and then if it is um found there is found to be a public harm we would look very closely at well, what, what makes sense? Do we want re roster or registration, which means everybody has to register, but there, you know, there's no educational requirements or other requirements to obtain it. A certification is optional. So folks could choose to be a certified peer support specialist, um, but to obtain that certification, they'd have to demonstrate certain qualifications um, or a license, which would require both qualifications and be mandatory. The reason I think it's necessary to do the report here, um, if OPR is to play a role in this certification, is there's 48 other states doing this. Um, I've done in the past two weeks a cursory review of their approaches. There are a myriad different number of approaches, but there's definitely best practices. There's also the reason for having the state certification is to pull down Medicaid funding and to have funding for the um, services. And to, I want to make sure that anything we draft, anything we put into law is consistent with the, those policies. So we're not just putting something into place where we're not getting reimbursement. Um, so those would be my concerns. We do reports every year. Uh, we would have this by December 15th. Um, so it could be something that could be taken up quickly next session um, and passed pretty immediately. I'm not sure what your ideal timeline is, but that would be our timeline. Yesterday would be great. <laughs> Uh, no, I, so no, thank you for that. That's, that's helpful clarification. I guess uh, um, the question would be that what, what I'm hearing you say is that folks can continue to be peer support specialists if they're not certified, whether there's nothing that would um, state that they would be barred from working in a peer support capacity. Absolutely. But, now, so then that raises the question about the, the guidelines, the conditions, the criteria that are in the bill that would define who in this state could be a peer support specialist. And we might add into that until um, as and they feel that they were acting appropriately and then also put in a uh, your sunrise, your certification sunrise. Is there, I'm trying to sort out what the barrier is to having the folks continue the work to um, be considered peer support specialists. And at the same time, by December 15th, getting your sunrise report, because you did indicate that they can, they can do this. Yes, it, from my perspective, this the current um, practices that um, Ms. Yandow and others are engaged in can continue. Um, I think the other benefit of waiting is um, the grant Shayla was talking about is really designed to provide structure as it's currently written. It's not clear what the scope of practice. As I said, I, I didn't realize that psychotherapy was not a part of it. And so it's not if OPR were to come in to regulate this, it wouldn't be clear to us who was providing the service, who wasn't providing the service, what service was being provided, the grant would help clarify that. Um, but again, I think what S-195 does is it provides a state certification which allows for Medicaid reimbursement. Um, and that does not prevent the current peer counseling services to continue. It just wouldn't um, allow until legislation takes place, I don't think it, and DIVA would have to actually answer that. It wouldn't under this structure be, a, um, I don't believe it would allow Medicaid 
uh, funding for it. But okay, I, yeah, this is this is very helpful because I mean the goal is to have an expansion of services and uh, as well to have some reimbursement in place. So now we're beginning to see the dichotomy between the folks who currently are peer su support specialists, those who are certified, those who are not, those who are certified, and then what the state might do going forward. It's not a, it's a trichotomy. Okay. Anyway, uh, Sheila, go ahead. Um, yeah, and just, I wanted to be clear that we do have, like Lauren said, we do have folks already working under our current you know, guidelines and regulations. And I don't know that we need anything to, to in legislation to allow them to continue to do that. But like Lauren said, I think that it is, the department wants to do this so that we can advance the, the field. Um, so it's not a, I, I don't know that we need more in the interim, but we do need this le next level or want this next level in the future. Nobody wants us to pass legislation. That's so hard to understand. You can totally, Lauren and I are, are welcoming you to require us to do this. We won't do we, it. We are going Please. to require something. I mean, the, the, this committee is very passionate about this area. And so we're going to work as hard as we can to have something in place. And we, we need we need to work with you, obviously, and that's what we're that's what we're doing. It's unfortunately taken a while to get here. Um, I apologize. I do have to leave. Um, I understand. So we'll, we'll, we're going to we're going to try to we're going to resolve these issues, and we're going to get some language put forward. Senator Hooker has been working very hard on this, and so we want to make sure we we move forward. Can Senator I, Hooker, can you know, can I be just, happy to do that with you. Comment. Senator Hooker and then Senator Cummings. Thank you. Um, Ms. Livingston, you talked about wanting to uh, proceed with the certification before doing the, the respite beds. And I, I really am concerned about that because I, I think we have a need for these beds now. We have people who are working in uh, our, you know, at a, a LISM where, you know, they know what they're doing. We've seen the, um, progress and and the all of the good work that this particular program has done this is our pilot i think and i'm i would like to be able to move forward with the respite beds with the peer support that we have even though these people are not certified yet but i i would hate to see um, us hold up the implementation of more peer respite beds um, waiting for certification of the peer specialists. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I want, you know, we, we really want to see the beds put into place. Okay. I, I hear that for sure. Se Senator Cummings. Yeah, I think the big change here is the Medicaid reimbursement mm -hmm. and that Peer support goes on, you know, we have it in substance abuse, we've got it in mental health, but we don't pay for AA treatment with Medicaid. Uh, and that's, that's what's going on. The other thing I've been told is that we have a ceiling in our Medicaid waiver, yes. and that for the first time we are coming up close to it. So if we take in another huge program, we may be, you know, stopping our ability to, to do something else because of the way it's set up. So I think that's why folks are being a little cautious is that there's state money going into this or a request for the first time. Right. It's that, that is the issue. That is a, a huge issue on this. And in my conversation with Senator Kitchell, we discussed that. So we would have to, um, we would have to look to Diva to give us some input. Uh, at, should we decide to go forward with everything at once? And, you know, it's maybe, maybe it's the expansion that can go on with the current system of support and then the certification is in place with some guardrails and information from 
diva on Medicaid reimbursement. Those are the kinds of things that we really have to juggle here without stopping uh, forward progress. And thank you, Senator Cummings, for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Sheila, did you want to comment again? I see you. No. Okay. Nope, disagreeing. Yep. Thank you. All right. So uh, questions committee for Shayla before she has to leave. Uh, we're not leaving this one. We're going to stick with it. We're going to bring Katie McClin uh, on board and then we'll hear from Katie and Cheryl. And I know that uh, Lauren, you're still here and we'd welcome your, your being here. And then Wilda White has asked to be involved in the discussion. This is going to be more of a discussion than testimony time. So we, we want to continue with this. Thank you Any, for having me, and I'm sorry. No, thank you very much, and don't uh, don't leave don't leave the issue. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're going to, issue. We we need we need you and the department to work closely with us to make sure that we have some language that, as we said, is going to take us forward. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so Cheryl, I'm going to turn to you um, because you've been working on this and let us know where you have gotten with any changes to the bill. And then you can bring in Wilda or Katie as you think will be helpful. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure again, I, I guess I, I was a little nervous when Ms. Livingston mentioned the beds and you know the uh, connection between the certification and the beds. And I, I don't know that that is necessary and uh, I would like to see the bed certainly moving forward. And I think we can come up with language for the certification piece that would uh, be acceptable to everybody involved. So are you suggesting that the bills be uh, acted on separately? Um, um, I, at this point, I would think that if there's, you know, I. I wouldn't want to see the respite beds held up because we don't have the language that we need for the um, certification bill. So at this point, I would say we should move on them separately, um, but I can get back to you on that. All right. Well, we'll certainly hear from others on that. So Lauren has testified that the certification sunrise could be completed by December 15th. And is that, is that accurate, Lauren? Yes. And then the sunrise needs to be, you might come back with a negative report, but we're not thinking that will happen. I, mean, I, <laughs> I think we OPR supports this concept and, and has, and what we've learned over the last couple of months um, have, it's a valuable resource and a valuable profession. I think our interest is making sure it's a defined scope and making sure it's something we can implement um, as a license or as a certificate. Now, my question for you is, as you go through the Sunrise process, do you reach out to folks at DIVA, for example, and looking at what the cost implications are uh, as you make the recommendation, or is that left separate is it simply as a profession with, with criteria for being that professional? We normally, um, our normal process is in statute. And so if it's called a sunrise report or the request is for a sunrise report, we look um, at those questions of, um, it, we wouldn't necessarily reach out to Diva unless the questions of, um, unless it relates to a question of like how to regulate. Um, what the best way to protect the public. That said, we have had reports in the past, um, requests from legislature, the legislature to ask other questions or consult with certain stakeholders. And it is a very stakeholder involved process with public hearings. And we reach out to groups independently to ask for their feedback and input. Um, and we try to really find that, that that's uh, the right size regulation for the profession. Okay, so I think that as we go forward, um, if we do ask for a sunrise, we may want to put some recommendations in place for you in that process. Certainly. We'll and, see, I mean, yeah. Um, Ms., uh, Legislative Council, chapter just, 
You just froze. Oh, I'm so sorry. Am I back again? Now you're back. Oh, good. Um, chapter 57 in Title 26, um, Ledge Council might be able to assist with that. Has our process, uh, has all the questions and we're supposed to look at? And that might help um, figure out what the language is. And we're happy to help too. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Senator Hardy. It does seem like um, we could move forward with S-195, even though my name's not on it. <laughs> Your name um, is all over it. Exactly. I'll just stamp my name on it. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but uh, And then um, with some modifications, like putting Addison County in all caps or something. No, just kidding. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> and then have on that, we, we, we can move for, as, as Senator Hooker said, I just want to sort of reiterate, we could move forward with the peer respite centers, knowing that there are people out there doing this work. The one issue, as, as Senator Cummings has noted, and others, that they might not get the Medicaid reimbursement in this first year or until things, but then we could tack on to that the sunrise process and the requiring diva or i'm sorry dmh to do what they're already doing but making sure it's codified to um OPR. to go to go through the process with the grant etc and and do i i mean because i think it's is important that we go through the right process to make sure that we have the right certification so that we can get medicaid funding um but also not hold up the good work that's already happening out there in the field. Um, so yeah. that would be what I would like to do um, and do it so that we make I, Yeah, I think that, and you know, it's, it seems like that's the direction we're headed. So that's good. Senator Hooker, go ahead. Um, I just wondered if uh, Senator Hardy was considering putting them together as we said, you know, either separating the bills or putting them together. I don't know, you know, I don't want to put anything on the respite center bill that would delay its implementation or sink the bill so oh. as Let, far yeah, as hold that thought hold that thought i mean senator hardy may want to we may we all want to decide keep them together or not but i yeah when unstable. you were talking you're you are unstable at this time my internet is unstable so i'm not hearing everything that's going as, on yeah we There's were like and we could tell. happening all over the place so um but i'll I see that Wilda has her hand up. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to go there in just a sec. So uh, I'm going to what I'm going to suggest is that as we start collecting all these ideas to Senator Hooker, I'm going to have you work again with uh, Ledge Council and uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about one or two bills as we're going forward. Um, Wilda, thank you for being with us this morning and you've got your hand up. So we're in a conversation mode, but can you please offer your thoughts as you're listening to all of this? Yes, thank you for um, allowing me to be here today. Wilda White, um, founder of Mad Freedom and representing the proponents of this legislation, the peer-led organizations here in Vermont. Um, I really appreciate everyone's concern that we get this right, uh, uh, which is why we proposed the certification program to begin with, because we wanted to get it right. Um, a couple of things um, about, I'll start with the sunrise. Um, I can understand why OPR uh, would want to do the sunrise because they don't understand what peer support is. Um, and it's, but I feel like if they knew more about it, they would understand how uh, unnecessary the sunrise report is. Because um, remember, this is something that is happening in 48 states plus the District of Columbia. Um, most of the states do not have uh, their Office of Professional Regulation involved in this um, for the very reason that um, for peer support to work, it needs to look very much different because it is from the medical profession. Um, and when we, you know, when I go onto the OPR website, as I've done over the, you know, the year when I was doing this work, um, it, I feel like it would scare people away from using peer support because uh, it doesn't have that same ethos. Um, and when we, when you hear, hear reference to this white paper that was done, 
in this grant that was written, you know, I was the one who authored, authored both of those. Um, and I, I, there's a, there's a, there, I felt, I feel like there were enough um, kind of, to quote a Senator Cummings, guardrails, that's the term we're using now, um, in that process to, uh, to allay all the concerns that have been, have been raised. Um, and I, I think what I would like to propose is that we do separate 194, which is the peer respite bill from 195, which is the peer certification bill. And that we look at, and that we approve, there's like, there's like three steps in that peer certification bill. There's the developing piece of the program, which I think um, doesn't seem to be attracting much controversy. And I think you can approve that piece of it. And then there's the screening and training piece. I think you could approve that as well. And then there's the certification body. Um, and I feel like we, I could offer you some language that I feel like would address all the concerns that have been raised here. Um, and it would be a splitting it into a two-step process. So even if OPR were ultimately going to be involved, there would still need to be a certifying body that they work with, right? So they would be doing what they're referring to as regulation. But even their other professions, they work with a certifying body. And so you could approve that piece of the concept. Um, and we could include language that says, okay, we're going to establish this certifying body according to the procedure that's being laid out in the bill. And then um, OPR could have a role as providing that uh, administrative, that kind of back office work, such as putting, you know, creating that roster that you talked about, um, helping with investigations um, if, it, if it came to that. So I feel like there is a role for OPR in staying true to peer support values. Um, and I feel like we could work that out um, if, you know, just a conversation with OPR, just explaining to them exactly what peer support is without completely derailing the bill and um, uh, lengthening the time uh, to get this done. Okay, yes, you're, you're headed in a direction that I was thinking about earlier. And I noticed in the, in the memo from OPR uh, that there is a, a, a paragraph that says uh, an inventory to look at an inventory of uh, certifications across the state and that might help. So um, here's, here's a, I'm, uh, Nolan has a comment to make before he has to leave at 1030. So why don't we, Nolan, let you come in and make that comment. And I'm going to say, I'm not, we're not forgetting what you just said, uh, Wilda. And I'm because I think that Senator Hooker uh, will be working with Ledge Council on this. I will also be help making myself available, as well as Laura, Lauren, and probably everybody else in DM, everyone in DMH. So it sounds like a, a team effort um, outside of committee to get us going here. But Nolan, you had some comments to make about 194. Sure. Uh, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. And also, let me just say on the record, uh, Wilda, thank you so much. I, I spent some time talking with Wilda on the phone and she helped me understand the bill. And so let me just say thank you publicly. Um, uh, the only things I wanted to sort of flag was on the money. If you move forward with the, was it seven centers? Yes. Unless we add Addison. Um, it says <laughs> five, $500,000 for each center. Um, and I just want to flag that right now the appropriation for the two existing centers was actually 477, but then they got these one-time supplementals. So, but going forward, they're only going to get 477, but the new ones are going to get 500. So keep, so we could either give the new ones 477 or you give the two existing ones 500. Now that's a lot of money, but I just want to just make sure there's some parity because the, the $24,000 I don't think is ongoing. I think it was supplemental as part of the emergency stuff. So that's one thing to keep in mind is how much you give to each. The second, I think Senator Cutler sort of brought up is like, um, you know, we don't know, I don't know if it'll be eligible for global commitment. We have concerns there. So 
I have to, I don't know what kind of federal state match we would be looking at to fund these. At, you know, and the bill right now is you know 3.5 for base and 250 for one time. Um, so I just want to flag that discrepancy in the funding. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to raise is, and this gets to the, um, you know, we normally we appropriate the money to DMH. My question is, and maybe Senator Hooker can answer this, is um, these centers don't exist currently, but we're, we're giving grants to something that doesn't exist. So our, I guess my question, maybe this gets to a level of, who is the money going to? Are these organizations, they have to create boards? Do they have to show some kind of fiduciary responsibility? Like how you know, we're creating centers and then we're giving money, but who are these people? Who, you know, who is it, a, you know, like do they have to come together and form a 501c3? So this is like a, a consideration when you think about putting money together in the short term. So I don't have an answer to that, but that was a sort of a concern about like, where does the money go? Uh, unless they already exist or some of the work groundwork's being done, I, that's just sort of a flag. Uh, or it could be a, some kind of an RFP similar to what DMH is currently doing. So yeah, that might be, yeah. the, answer. That might yeah. be the, the RFP. Okay. Um, Wilda might have more information on that as well, if it's okay, Senator Alliance. No, go ahead. Yes, Senator Lyons, you're, you're exactly right. It would be similar to the RFP process that the uh, state already uses. And the vision was, um, you know, as these get up and running, that they would be uh, run as a network to achieve economies of scale so that people weren't duplicating processes like human resources. They would get discounts on insurance. Um, they would uh, co-locate. They, they would, uh, you know, do Medicaid reimbursement at a single location. Um, so, so that's, that, that's the idea. And that's, the that's helpful. Does that help? Thank you, Nolan. That's helpful. And I know you brought up the issue about, uh, the funding discrepancy earlier, and it's good to have, have it on the table. It just helps when, when you, yeah. the consideration of when you, if you move forward, uh, yeah. how I would cost it out. That's all. So it's, uh, what was the, what it was, it's 3.5 base and- The bill currently has 3.5 base funding and then 250 one time, but that's to give, that's for the, right. the, 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 the partnership for the existing yeah. one. Yeah, okay. Uh, go ahead, Senator Hardy. Hopefully my internet holds up. It's just really windy and icy here, so. Um, I think this is a question for Wilda. Um, is that okay if I ask her a question? Oh yeah, we're in okay. conversation mode. Is that okay with you, Wilda? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been a confusion of mine since the bill came out, since what I think it's 195 with the respite centers, the whole concept of the pilot. And um, it seems to me like there's part of the bill that's creating the actual peer respite centers, the ones that aren't already in existence. And then there's this pilot, which seems to be a sort of collaboration or partnership or something between two existing peer respite centers and a community center. Community no. center. Two, two, so I don't know if you've asked your question, but. I'm just kidding. If you could explain the pilot part of okay. it, that would be okay. great. <laughs> so this is the pilot. So currently we have in the state um, two community centers um, for people with mental health challenges. One is in... Burlington, it's called Pathways Community Center, and one is in Montpelier, it's called Another Way Community Center. Um, and the idea is that each of these, um, if, if, if 194, if 194 is the peer respite bill. Um, so if one, 194 would create these new peer respites, one would be located in Burlington, one would be located in uh, Montpelier and then other places. And so, with the peer respite, with the, with the community center in Burlington and the community center in, in Montpelier, they would each get an additional appropriation of about $100,000 to create programming that would um, coordinate the program of the new peer respite in Burlington and the new peer respite in Montpelier to achieve those synergies that we know exist between affiliating 
community centers of peer respites. And Sarah Davidow talked about those. She talked about it, it, it you know, it, there's a seamless trans transition when somebody leaves the peer respite and go, because they've already been introduced to the community center. It also helps create wraparound support services to that person at the, in, when they're in the community so they don't have to wait until they're in crises to access services. Um, it also, one of the big problems about people with mental health challenges is that we're incredibly isolated and we don't have friends and community. And so this helps build that community. And then when you, and you can, so you can reach out and people are keeping an eye on you um, before you're in crisis and helping you. Um, and then oftentimes we see when people go to the community center and they've been working all day on a problem and it comes five o'clock and they have to go home, they freak out and they go to the ER. Well, if you have an affiliated um, you know, peer respite, you'll know during the day that this person is probably gonna need some place to stay tonight. And you can work on that and you can offer that person this respite service so they don't head off to the ER or, or do something worse. They just, they just go to the respite, right, um, for that night. And then the next day they're back at that community center working those same problems. So that's, so, you know, ideally we would like every single new peer respite to have an affiliated community center, but you know, that's a big ask and obviously we can't do that that year, but we wanna get this uh, idea piloted. Um, and okay. I think, yeah. Can I just ask a follow-up to that? So that that's helpful to understanding it. Um, but the that the the peer respite new peer respite center portion of the bill could move forward without the pilot. And yes. the pilot could move forward without the other part of it. Is that true? Or do those peer respite centers need to happen first? The pilot couldn't move forward without the peer respite because we right. are affiliating the peer respite, but you could remove the pilot out of the bill. That's true. And you would still get the seven peer respites. Okay. Not that I want to do that. I just, what, what my confusion was when we're creating these new things and then I see pilot, I was like, which comes, I was, it was a chicken then egg thing. And I wasn't sure if the egg had to come from the chickens. No, no. We I mean, it's really, yeah, I think, I I think, think it does <laughs> we, were trying to we were trying to restrain ourselves, you know, we want to get this idea of affiliating them out. And so we thought, well, perhaps we can offer a pilot in this bill, but if it's confusing, you know, we, we, we can, we can take it out of the bill. Um, Maybe it's only confusing to me, but that's helpful. Um, it's it's less confusing now. I, I get oh, it. Oh, um, look so at Senator, <laughs> when, it, when you have a community center uh, that gets fitted up with the respite center in Addison County, you'll be very sure. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> if we had one in Addison County, I'd get it better. So. Yes, <laughs> I think there was a little you. confusion too, because Ms. Livingston was talking about piloting the peer respite centers, I, I think. Yeah. Uh, that that yeah. was... And I should have said something earlier, but you know that's why I said we have a pilot for peer respite in like a silum, a listen. Um, you know they've already proven themselves, but the pilot is the connection between the community center and the peer respite center. So, so this is this is a really great conversation, and um, the the issue of. Um, the issue, the issues are are beginning to be become clearer. Uh, so I I'm gonna I I've asked Katie if she will work with Cheryl with you and others to get us to a place where a we understand what the money would be. So that's important. And and well, that we need to be clear on how many people are waiting out in the out there to begin a respite center. I mean, are there people out there right now who would be putting in a proposal if an RFP went out? And so yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, every, it's like so every everybody now who who like so pathways would put in a proposal. Another way would put in a yeah. proposal. Okay. Um, Mont psychiatric side fibers will put in a proposal. Listen, would put in a proposal to open up, and you know, so there are people waiting to put these proposals in. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is good. It's Sen Senator Cummings, go ahead, and then I'll want to finish my thought before Katie has to leave. Go ahead. Muted. Um, 
<laughs> I was talking with my local peer community center. And we had just had a meeting with our local mental health agency who said 30% of their workforce is peer to peer. And they, I know we, I was asking because I know we set up respite beds. That was how we were trying to, and I was told no, because they're part of the government, people won't go there. So I'm just, wondering are we how are these going to be integrated with existing peer these were peer support beds crisis beds um and i know there's some there's quite a few of them around the state how how are these totally separate um or are all of these age peer support people that are presently working for mental health, will they be able to get Medicaid coverage? Um, these are that, questions. These these are questions that absolutely need to be answered uh, before Medicaid gets put in place. But but I'm hearing that there. I mean, we know there's a need out there. Yes, we do. It, it's awful. It's awful. Um, but and we also know that um, there there are people ready to help. So if if there are some funds available to expand the Alyssum Pathways type model, then maybe we'll we'll begin to cover some of the needs that are out there. But that we're not going to be able to answer all the questions, I, I think, because you're you're raising a very good point. And how does that link in with the current a set of respite beds that we have. What about mm -hmm. Medicaid payments? And then we move into the other bill on certification. And how do we um, continue the current peer-to-peer -peer that we have while also expanding to a new, uh, I don't know, a roster or a certification? We, we're not sure what it would be. So, and then doing an inventory across the state for what certifications are out there. So this will help not only adult peer to peer, but kid kid peer to peer. So th there's a lot here and a lot of decision making points. Um, and I'm going to let you talk in just a minute, Will. To hang on, and then um, so it, my 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 suggestion is that Senator Hooker, that you have a lot of questions to dive into. I will work with you on this, and with Katie and with others because we need to resolve some of the decision points and get it back into committee. Okay, is that good? And, and Wilda, you wanted to comment, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna make sure you're keeping in mind that um, ultimately whether um, the services of peer support specialists will be Medicaid reimbursable is not whether it's OPR regulated, it's really whether right. it meets CMS yeah. regulations. Yes, we understand. Okay. Yeah, we get we get that. We yeah. get that. And and their regulations are not like OPRs. You know, they're very distinct. They mm -hmm. only require a statewide certification with continuing education requirements and amendment of the state plan. Okay. And they leave it very much up to the state to design the certification program. Okay. This is helpful. And and I know SAMHSA has its own guidelines. SAMHSA is uh, but, yeah, irrelevant when it comes to yeah. the certification. Right. They just support certification. Right. And they have created uh, tools to help states uh, implement the programs. OK. So it sounds like there is a little bit of work to do. And uh, we don't want to leave these bills behind. We want to take a step forward. And the Department of Mental Health has said they're going to do some kind of a RFP. So some inclusion perhaps of that would be important. So working with DMH, uh, Mad Freedom, OPR, Senator Hooker, you have a, and the most important person of all besides Senator Hooker, it's Katie McClinton. <laughs> <So. laughs> Okay. 
uh, that's the direction, Katie. I think we're going to head out to uh, cover as uh, respite centers in a way that makes sense stepwise, perhaps through an RFP. And then, um, and then, um, what else was I going to say? We're good. Yeah. We'll chat. Katie, I don't want to hold you up because I know you you need to leave. So is there anything else? Could you Thank you. I appreciate it. Here? I've been listening and taking notes. And I, right. it sounds like the, the next step is I will um, circle back with Senator Hooker. Um, and um, maybe we can start putting some words on a page. OK. All right. Anything else, committee? Senator Hooker? I'm just having trouble with the chats. So just ignore the ones that are coming. We're going to turn that thing off. I do that. <laughs> no, it's important. Not seeing one. Huh? No, did oh. she say just ignore? I thought she no. told me to ignore something. There's no chat. No, no, no. I, I, okay. My chats yeah. are going to different places. So anyway. Yeah, I got that. I didn't get it. All right. Um, Anything else, committee, on 194, 195? OK. Wilda and Lauren, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're, we're working at light speed, so warp speed, it's called, I guess. Um, so we want to, we'll, we'll be in touch. Uh, Senator Hooker and others will be in touch so we can move forward on this. Thank you for your time. Thank you for including me. And I'm very happy to do any kind of writing uh, if you need language. Oh, so good. Don't hesitate to call on me, please. OK. And and Lauren, you may want to stay in for the 197 discussion. We're, we're touching on certification, but um, it, it's not going to be as robust, I think, because Katie is not here. But if you could stick around, that would be helpful. OK, so. Um, let, let's just take a few minutes on 197, then, and I'll tell you where we are with that bill, then, um, and how I've, been, how I've been working on that bill. And then we'll try and find some time to take a break. Um, and then when we, you'll, we'll be back. And Ruth, you're gonna be taking over with, whether, with or at, without a break, so, okay. All right, so let's go to 197. There is a little draft that is on uh, under Katie's name. Um, if you refresh, there is also information from Holly Morehouse uh, regarding 197, and you can read that um, going forward. But so. As we've taken testimony and we completely understand in this committee, and then we've also taken testimony in the education committee and Senator Hooker, Senator Terenzini and I have heard that information. We know what a crisis we're at with kids in schools where the school doesn't have the capacity to deal with some of the mental health issues that they're seeing. So, and we know also that the after school program has been working closely with the administration through an executive order on um, a variety of after school programs, not necessarily mental health issues. So as, as we heard that testimony, um, became, it really becomes apparent that something has to happen with kids, with schools, and to provide some support services for them perhaps through the work that people like Holly Morehouse is doing, and then what Sonny McNaughton testified to, or Sandy Yandow, there are diff with different levels of certification for peer-to-peer -peer support, understanding that there are levels for very young kids, levels for adolescents, and uh, certain kid not, not kids in school are not adults yet, and but they're approaching it. But so it's more of how do we put in place uh, programs and the programs that are here are mostly linked in with the after school. So as you go through the bill, 
and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it today. And there because there are reasons for that, but just that there will be grants. One of the proposals in the bill is to allow for the Department of Mental Health to provide that are defined grants with specific criteria, working closely with the Agency of Education to provide after school and other support services for kids uh, who um, may have some, some needs, some mental health needs. The issue that we have bumped into as we've talked with um, after school with DMH and then with the Agency of Education, the issue that we've run into, of course, nothing new, it's funding. Um, we have been told that ESSER funding, which is um, funding that goes for to schools for educational use and work, we have been told that the guidelines for ESSER funding allow for the proposal that is here and drafted in the legislation allows for the Department of Mental Health to work closely with AOE to distribute um, an RFP or grants, put an RFP out and then distribute grants for uh, coordinated peer-to-peer -peer or, or peer, peer support for kids, mental health for support for kids. The Agency of Education disagrees with the interpretation that ESSER funds can be used in that way. And that's why I included uh, the Holly Morehouse's memo where she cites the guidelines for the use of ESSER funds. I have asked, and I've been working with JFO on this as well. And so we have not gotten clarity yet on the use of ESSER funds because it seems like a real you know, a win-win situation where schools are in dire need of mental health support for kids, where we have a Department of Mental Health willing to help and, um, and funding from the federal government. So we're trying to sort out that funding piece and that may influence the way the draft is written. The other, um, um, the other issue is, as we, ha as I indicated early earlier, there was an executive order put out um, in the fall that would have an interagency um, after-school youth task force, and so we're just asking that the reports and the work that they do get reported back to the legislature, because their work uh, will go on as long as funding is available, and that goes past this session and I think it actually goes to the end of the next session. So having that information and, and coordination um, is helpful. As part of the bill there, um, as we started talking about, we started talking about certification with uh, Sandy Yandow and Sonny uh, Naughton when, when they were in to testify. And so we're, the, the bill that we just finished talking about and asking OPR to do a, a kind of a, a, a look at what all the certifications are out there would help inform what's available for kids. So that's where this bill is. And Senator Cummings. Couple of questions. ESSER funds are one-time funding. Yeah. And this would be an ongoing program? No, it would only exist as long as there's funding. I mean, that's the point. You know, we're it, it's at a crisis point right now, so it's like acute yeah. care, you know. And and, and so, okay. see how it, uh, there has to be some um, reporting back and how it's working. And All right. the after school program theoretically will become embedded into our culture, but uh, we can't promise funding for all of this going forward. The other question I have is, my local mental health agency actually runs an alternative school where kids go temporarily when they need counseling. Yeah. 
so I'm assuming some of these kids with ongoing issues have an existing relationship with a counselor. Are we setting up a second system so they'd have a second counselor after school? And, a, a, you know, again, how are we going to coordinate these services? Because that we've got services that are there that were severely underfunding. Um, and we're, and we're setting up new kind of temporary programs. So I just want to make sure that yeah. we're getting so, a program that will yeah. be consistent because for a kid to start something and build a relationship and then have it end could be, do a lot of damage. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, so you're talking about um, kids, the first aid for kids type program where you maybe have some activities that keep kids from um, mental health outbreaks or behavioral yeah. outbreaks. The, the issue we're facing right now with schools is a huge, is an escalation in in need that goes oh, yeah. probably above and beyond what we have currently. So, but that's a good question. And we'll have to, uh, I'm going to have to sort that one out a little bit. Go ahead, Ruth. Um, just looking at the language, sort of scrolling through it for the first time. Um, I'm, I, I mean, a couple comments. The, there are a lot of things that these programs are supposed to do for the program for, to get the grant and the grants will undoubtedly be pretty small because $250,000 is not that much money. Um, so I'm just a little concerned about the heavy requirement list for a small one-time grant. Um, not that I disagree with any of the things that are listed. I mean, I think they're all valuable, but, and, to um, it, my understanding as reading through this is that these would be grants to existing programs, right? So if it's like the Boys and Girls Club that already has an after school program, they could apply for this grant to do a little yeah, bit more, it, yeah, or it, something it, like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. Or, and that, so the folks that we had brought in to testify who are currently doing this, and it would help to expand the availability of programs across the state because the after school program now is is the after school program but this would help expand it somewhat what people we brought in I'm, i don't remember after. i'm up to thinking about the sandy yandows and the sunny naughtons and the lynn codas those folks who are oh i didn't, under, talk about I didn't think they were doing after school programming that well they are capable they can apply for these grants and would be willing to do that. They're not oh. named here, but you'll, well, they are named here. For example, youth mental health first aid and other evidence-based techniques. So there are programs that have some uh, track record. Okay, well, there yeah. are nine things these programs would have to do to get a grant, which is, a, and they're, a, they're pretty yep. intensive. So I, I, I wonder if we want to uh, I don't, you know, let, yeah, no, I, th like I think, I think it looks like a lot. Are... I think it looks like a lot, but in reality, I think that these are people or they won't apply unless they have this capacity. They've already this done is a something. lot of capacity though. I mean, they yeah. have to do training. They have to do mm -hmm. assisting families. They have to do um, mm -hmm. Partnerships with teachers and pediatricians. They, I mean, this is a lot to do. Well, they don't have to do grant. all of it. They might do yeah. some of it. So we'll. That's what it let, says let, the way it's drafted. That's right. What yeah. Concerned. Let's let's so. go through the bill when we have Katie here, and we'll fine tune it because it's still a work in progress. But okay. My other are good. question is: there are after school grants that were just announced that are federal grants through the Agency of Education. Mm -hmm. um, for after school and summer programming, and that's $4.25 million. Right. So I'm wondering how but does they're not, this... Yeah. So the, the value of this one is it's mental health. That's the value of this one. It is distinct. 
I don't see that as a different, I, it doesn't, I mean, if these are supposed to be mental health programs after school, I'm just not sure. Go to um, doing this. So and go to section two and it will indicate that the ESSER funding, the, whatever the funding is right now, it's ESSER funding yeah. to the Department of Mental Health to establish and administer a two-year program in consultation with the AOE. No, I got so, that. I got and, then that. It, and that programs to support the mental health and wellness needs of students, families, and staff. So they don't have to do all of that, but they will. That there will be a mental health focus. It says the department shall issue grants to after-school programs. Um, that uh, it, when the applicant meets the following eligibility criteria, and right. then it lists nine things that they have to do to get a small little grant. Yeah. Well, and we can I, modify that. We'll have to go through it and see if that is something to be modified, but understanding that the section two is pretty clear about the um, overall intent. So. Okay, I just don't see that this is materially different than the after-school grants that are already- it's me it, is, it is mental health. Those programs are not necessarily related to some mental health issues. So, and I, so I, what I would encourage you to do is to go through the bill again, everyone. I mean, we all have to go through it again and then uh, look at the information that's come to us from the after school folks. And then we'll be pursuing the funding piece um, and related social, emotional, and mental health needs in education. Cause we've talked about this in there as well. Senator Cummings. I wanna hear from our local mental health agencies and hear what they're doing. Um, I don't want to supplant their programs. Mm -hmm. And if there's any extra money out there, they can all use it. So uh, this is a good comment. And, and as we have heard, the local schools, some of the schools have uh, working relationships with their local mental health agencies. But that's not ubiquitous and it isn't covering all the need that's out there so there will be some you're you're right there will be some uh geographic and other decision making that has to go on so we don't want that conflict you're absolutely right okay Okay, one more, because then I'm going to- I just gonna... wonder if this $250,000 might be better used for supporting school-based clinicians. Um, there are some schools that have them and are, and some schools that don't, and maybe those school-based clinicians could then do some after-school or summer work, but that- That's a, that, that without... that's a possibility. I mean, it would the school would have to, the AOE would have to agree to that right now. That hasn't been the case, but we'll see what happens. So we can ask that, we'll ask that question, Senator Hooker and, uh, and Senator Terenzini and I will ask that question when we get into education. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be valuable. I mean, just, I, I, I without revealing too much, I know from personal experience that these yeah. based clinicians are super necessary and overwhelmed. And if we could direct support directly to them rather than creating new programs. Cause I really feel like there's already pro there's funding for after school programs that just came out. But um, this is different. I mean, this may be administered through that, but it is different. It is mental health. It could become segregated from, but having this accessibility will be important to schools overall and to kids. So we'll, you know, we'll talk about it. They're good questions. Okay. One, one more. No, not on this one. I just want uh -oh. at some point we're going to talk about what bills we're going to try and get out. Yes. Because there was an article that came out about the wait times being excessive. And you and I have a bill that's aimed at dealing with some of that. Um, I'm just wondering if we're going to be able to get that out. 
Yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to get that out. I know the house is working on that. So it may be a time when we get something from the house that we can work on that. I do suggest that you that you look at which patients were referenced in the wait time process. They were patients without referral. They were patients without uh, primary docs. They were patients who just called up to ask uh -huh. for uh specialty support so somehow you know that doesn't some of that some of that report is problematic but anyway we can talk uh, about that okay. all right uh, committee i need to leave and i'm going to suggest that you guys take a six minute break and then come back or whatever you, ruth decides um and um we have <laughs> And on Tuesday, uh, Senator, thank you. I will send an email out regarding some of the bills that we're going to be looking at and trying to get out ASAP. We've been working on a lot of them, but there will be others as well. And we'll do that. Lauren, thank you for being here and going through our discussion. And if you have thoughts on certification for children's um, support services, uh, as I had I had talked with Lauren Hibbert about this, so I don't know whether she's conveyed information to you or not about whether the national certification and serves a purpose or how does it serve a purpose in, um, in the state process? Yes, we've discussed it and um, I think we can offer some support and some thoughts on that. As okay, you that's good, all right. All right, because this is not, this is not, again, it's not, um, psychotherapy it's right. support to different level right okay yes, we're, we're happy to discuss and um talk further with wilda or with with folks here and with ledge council as well okay all right thank you, thank you all. all right ruth i'm turning it over you to you and i am leaving so okay enjoy thank you thank um, you good luck with your meeting Thank you.